Hi, Helen Lockhead and I'm going to moderate tonight. And I'm also a CTP UH New South Wales committee member. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat is a global not-for-profit organisation focused on tall buildings and sustainable cities. Based in Chicago, with a worldwide network of members and volunteers from a broad range of disciplines across the built environment, we share practice, knowledge and thought leadership through our cutting-edge research, our data collections, publications, conferences, project recognition and advocacy. So if you're not a member already, please consider joining today. I just wanted to thank our major sponsors, Oxford and Schindler, and also our event sponsors tonight, Atelier 10 and UTS. So thank you all. We couldn't do it without you. And of course, thank you to Cox Studio for this wonderful venue, for this event. But before we go to our guest speaker tonight, we've just had a global conference in Singapore. I recently attended the, the conference in Singapore uh, a few weeks ago now. Um, and it was, it was amazing, obviously. I just want to run you through that pretty quickly, um, touch on some of the highlights. Uh, when the team said to me, are you, are you able to do that this evening? I thought, excellent. I'm, I'm sure everyone's been in this situation where you, you go away to a different city, eat lots of food, meet lots of new people, see lots of amazing things, take all the photos, uh, and you get back and no one wants to look at your photos. I was like, I've got a captive audience. I'm going to spend 25 minutes going through. Um, but I do want to show you some photos. Um, it's very, very quick. Um, essentially, the, the conference was at Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. If you haven't been, next long haul flight, I do recommend that you stop over there. It was really, really amazing. Um, over 1,000 attendees at the conference, I think from around 30, 40 countries. Um, so really well attended. Uh, Singapore, really excellent city as well, um, if you haven't been. Very, very humid and hot, so shed the, the suit jacket. Uh, I don't know why, but I always found myself going back to Marina Bay Sands when I was walking around the city. Just the, the beautiful architecture, the gardens, which Patrick uh, had a hand in as well. Uh, it's just amazing and something that we don't have here in Sydney. In terms of the, the conference, uh, this is a, an image of our workshop that we had on the first day. You'll see that the room's not totally packed, but that's because it was a very intimate workshop. Um, it was a workshop with people from the, the UK, the US, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, um, Australia. So there, there was all these different perspectives and it was about thinking about human scale in taller buildings. And it built on the theme of the conference of humanizing high density. Um, it was excellent. Uh, my colleagues who, who work at uh, Architectus, Michelle and Alex, warmed up the crowd for me on this whole Sydney versus Melbourne debate. Uh, and then I dived into the ethos urban perspective of design competitions in Sydney. And just the feedback we got of, you know, what Sydney does really, really well in design competitions, and I'm sure you've been to CTBUH events around those, is something not seen elsewhere in the world and people were just blown away by what we do in that and how we really start to think about people pretty early on in projects. Uh, walking around the city, um, if you've been to Singapore, these absolutely amazing buildings everywhere. You know, the, the public art, um, if you can stay outside in the humidity for a while. You know, the greenery in the buildings, I timed my run pretty poorly in that I didn't go up to the Sky Gardens because they shut on the weekends. Um, but look, you can really see that the incentives Singapore have there for greenery of buildings, creating those great spaces in buildings really do work. Um, maybe something we could look into here in Sydney. Uh, what really struck me walking around C Singapore and one of the talks that I did attend was the, the, the sheer scale of these buildings comparison back to Sydney. Uh, one of the key developers there, Keppel Land, were presenting a building and they talked about it as a suburban scale building. And I was like, all right, cool, that's you know, sort of like 10 stories or so, even less for us here. It was a 200 metre tall building. So like, awesome, I'm gonna take that back and that's our suburban scale now. But the conference itself, um, I won't go through and, and bore you with all the elaborate details. There was amazing speakers, amazing topics. 
just the topic of humanising high density, bringing it back down to how people use buildings and buildings aren't just objects uh, in, in the sky, something that we'll really dig into this evening. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to Patrick's um, presentation on that. But one of the, the really, I guess, key things that I learned from it was all of the same topics, all the same issues that we're grappling with here in Australia, you know, sustainability, affordable housing, housing crisis, um, you know, creating spaces for people. Everyone's experiencing the same challenges all across the world. I know maybe I'm a bit naive to think, well, wow, everyone's, everyone's grappling with this, but it really was that, that moment that they are and we're, we're all trying to achieve the same goal and trying to find the same solutions. Another thing that I took out of it, and maybe I didn't need to go to Singapore for that, but I'll take it, uh, was a lot of the Australian speakers, a lot of my colleagues that were there, um, some of them in the room this evening, spoke just tremendously about the work that we're doing here in Australia. And it was sort of a light bulb moment for me of, we're doing really, really great work here in Australia, and we really think about humanising high density already with the high density that we have. So we're thinking about spaces, about places, about how people use them. Even this evening, seeing everyone in this room you know, this isn't a chore for our work. It's something that we're passionate about. And I think just coming together, you know, the presenters were, were so powerful from Australia and the project example is so great. Something that we just need to keep on doing uh, and keep on doing it well. Special shout out to the whole team from the Key Quarter project. Um, I know Sasha is in the room tonight. He won the Urban Habitat Award and I think they won seven awards across the thing. Good, <laughs> good, um, excellent. Uh, uh, one more, one more minute, Patrick. Um, excellent, uh, excellent recognition from you know an Australian project which really hit the high notes. You know, best tall building in the world, best tall building in Oceania, and essentially urban habitat, the best place. And I thought that was really important and special that we're thinking about the place already. As I say, I probably didn't need to go to Singapore to to figure that out, but I'll take it. Um, but I also got to, to do a whole lot of great things, eat a whole lot of great food. So if anyone wants to come and see me after, I've got 600 more photos I can take you through. Um, but appreciate the time. I do hear this could be wildly inaccurate, but it could be in London next year. Don't tell me that wrong. London or um, Paris. London or Paris. London and Paris. Or oh, and Paris, both great places. Um, so yeah, have, have a good think about it. You can also come to the realisation that we're doing pretty well here in Australia, but you can have a great holiday at the same time. Thanks, everyone. Um, our guest speaker tonight was a star attraction at the conference in Singapore, having just been named the recipient of the Fessler R. Khan Lifetime Achievement Award. He is the director of the Global Sustainability Design Consultancy Atelier 10, in fact, the founding director. And in recognition of his pioneering work integrating high performance environmental technologies with architecture over the last 40 years, he was given this extraordinary award. So he's going to reflect on his four decades of environmental design, innovation, and leadership, and the insights shaping a new generation of transformation. So thank you, Patrick, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also just like to add thanks to, to Jen and Emma and our team from Atelier 10 who've been working really hard over there to sort out your drinks and, and socials. Good work team. I, I don't come here nearly often enough, clearly, because it's, it's such a warm place and I've had such a wonderful, a wonderful reception since coming down here from the Singapore event. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm somewhat humbled by the, 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 the turnout and uh, look forward to trying to, to entertain you and to tell you a few of our stories from down the years. So I set up Atelier 10 in a, in a little basement in, uh, in Goode Street in London, you know, Goode Street just off Tottenham Court Road, um, working with a guy called Neil Thomas out of Atelier, who's, who'd formed Atelier One, who are structural engineers. Um, and uh, over the, that was in, in 1990, and over the intervening uh, 33 years last Friday, um, uh, we, we've been sort of expanded to be all over the, all over the world. And, and a lot of my team, so, so Paul Stoller, who you may, a lot of you may know who's based here in Sydney, 
started with me in London, then went and opened our New York business, and then the, the, uh, California, and then and has, has come down here to open up the Sydney office. So we've, we've very sort of organic growth over the last 30 years, and we've kept it fairly, uh, a very f family like operation. Uh, we're now about 350 people. Um, although we are now part of the Sabana Jerome group um, from the Singaporean uh, engineering firm. So we've been lucky enough to work on, on buildings large and small around the world. Um, and uh, here in Australia, we've, we've started our, 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 our first project here was in, on, in uh, Melbourne and Federation Square. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a bit more detail later. So our, our first project here was Fed Square, but now since then we've been starting to work on some lovely projects here. And I see Paul is at the back, he's finally got here from his project meeting, um, and has been working hard doing projects like the Bandanan Art Bridge and Museum, uh, the, the, um, the museum in um, Perth, the new museum in Perth. And we had a great tour this morning of Sydney Modern where we were working, we've been working on. So I'm going to zoom by these, but we're doing lots of good things here in Australia now from our, our amazing team. Um, but I'm, I'm based in London but I also have an oversight of what's going on around the world. And we've been working in sort of net zero so-called projects probably for the last 10 or 15 years, and that's become part of the, part of the dialogue uh, of, of, of our design, design language. But I think it's, it's important maybe just to take a, sort of take a step back and look, about, uh, look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. The, there's a fundamental uh, need, as we all know, uh, to, to deal with the climate change issues. Um, and to rethink our relation, the relationship between different aspects of our design uh, toolkit. And I'm going to come on in the second half of the talk to talk about the relationship between operational energy and embodied energy, or operational carbon and embodied carbon, to be correct, terminologically correct. Because we've spent our first 32 and a half years almost completely focused on driving operational carbon out of buildings, often without really understanding the, the important sort of interconnection between the two things. Um, and so that will I'll come to in the second half of the talk. In the first half of the talk, I will show you our enthusiastic embracing of a kind of reduction in uh, operational carbon. So the first project I was going to touch on is a, is a project called the Earth Centre, which was in, um, in, in the north of England in Doncaster, not the most prepossessing place, on a colliery spoil heap in Yorkshire, which we started in the early 1990s. The first project we were building on the site was, was a, the Planet Earth Gallery just here, which is a... Um, 3,500 square meter gallery space. Um, it's, that's it on the left. It's a rammed earth building with an earth covered roof out, out of the front. Uh, I think at the time, the largest solar panel array uh, in Europe um, built on a timber thinning structure, uh, forest thinnings of, of timber. But we, we were really trying to, struggling to think about how we were going to environmentally control this in a very passive way. The structure engineers, who were at Atelier 1, were, were looking at a very thick raft because they were building on a coal spoil heap across some fault lines, so they were going to build a very big raft. So these were my doodles from 96, saying, hey, what if we hollowed the raft out and made lots of passageways, we call it a labyrinth, um, a labyrinthine tunnels that would sort of push the air through. So I did a, a summer day and a summer night and tried to figure out how it all worked, and lots of obedient arrows doing what I wanted them to do, as we affectionately call them. Um, and so the, the obedient arrows seemed to work. I faxed this to the architect, get that, that's, that's uh, how it works in those days, to Peter Clegg and said, how about this, Peter? Um, and he, we sort of, so it, and so it went. And so the influence for it, and hence, this is where the termites come in, was very much rooted in, a, in sort of uh, some work I've been doing with my professor at university, a guy called Derek Kroom, around uh, the performance of, of anthills in, in, uh, in, in hot weather. Has anyone heard about the termite? I'm sure you've all had the termite talk before. But the termites are pretty remarkable creatures because I'm going to move these tables out of the way before I deck, stack them on the floor. Um, I'm going to fall over them and then spill water everywhere. Um, so the termites the, keep the queen at 30 to 31 degrees centigrade through hot weather and cold weather. Um, and they do that by um, blocking and unblocking holes in the structure using mud and earth. And as they unblock them, the air is drawn upwards by a sort of Bernoulli effect and also by the wind blowing across the top, or by stack effect and Bernoulli effect. And it draws air into this huge underground chamber here. So relative to the termites, the termites are creatures that long, blind, no formal architectural training whatsoever. <laughs> uh, and they understand how to build these big underground structures with the big, these big fins. And the moisture from the nest runs down, their excretions, and that causes evaporative cooling. And when it gets really hot, the termites have been observed heading down to the water table with leaf stems and seed pods. They gather water, bring it back up, and do, get the evaporative cooling working in the, in the, in the, um, 
in, in this lower cavity. Now, David Attenborough and a film crew can get in this space. So this thing is the, they hollow it out and build these big structures on top. Um, Eugene Murray is a, a, an anthropologist uh, from a South African anthrop anthropologist who wrote a book called The Soul of the White Ant. And he it was, was a very unkind anthropologist in that he, he used to mark the back of a termite to observe them heading down so he could figure out how far they were going. And they were going sort of 8, 10 meters down to the water table and back up. So they'd be gone for half an hour to bring a tiny drop of water. He then would do this weird thing. He, would, <laughs> he drove a metal plate diagonally through the nest and then killed the queen to figure out how the, he was trying to work out how the control system worked. And when he killed the queen, within a few minutes, all the rest of the whole of the nest would, would die, stop moving and die. So they were, they were actually conversing through pheromones as a control system, which I suppose you could say is like AI. I don't know. Maybe I'm being a bit naive, but it's a sort of pheromonic control system. But they, they're, they're controlled, and there's a whole heating system as well that I haven't got time to talk about, based on mushrooms and things like that. Um, so, but just humbling for an environmental engineer. So that, that, so th but the, the main things, I should say, thermal mass, conduction, convection, and understanding of sort of flow was what it was all about. There's also some amazing um, buildings. Th th these are buildings in, in northern Italy, in, the, in a town called Costozza, the Villas Venti, where Galileo used to go for his holidays, because it was the coolest place outside of Florence to go. And this wonderful illustration by Barbara Kender shows Prometheus, who stole the sun from Zeus, casting his rays down on the facade of the building, while Zephyrus, who's the god of the southwest wind, puffs some air into this cave system. And then the houses have got these marble, marble grills in the floors, and all the air comes up from the caves and cools the building. So this, this is kind of, bear with me, but this is like labyrinth conversation. This is how we got into the idea, OK, if we can put thermal mass in the ground, um, this used to be wine caves as well. So if you could put alcohol in there too, all the better, but I suppose. But that wasn't, that wasn't how it really worked. So we came back to this idea in this building. So just zoom back to the earlier slides of this sort of uh, first sketches of a labyrinth. Um, and this diagram sort of shows how it worked. And we basically, although it looks like a lot of material, we did actually remove a lot of material because it would otherwise have been void formers and concrete to form a giant raft. So we formed a kind of biscuit double sort of wafer slab and the air passes back and forward through about 150 meters of tunnel before it gets into the space. The, this illustration was drawn by uh, Donald Bates and Peter Davidson, who were neighbors of ours in Gooch Place at the time and who became the architects of Federation Square, which explains the next bit of a story, which was when we did the competition for Federation Square, they said, we should have a labyrinth. Um, and we looked at the sort of weather data for, uh, for Melbourne, which generally is pretty hot in the daytime, but most nights the wind swings around to the south and you get cool breezes off the, off the Southern Ocean. So it actually was an ideal candidate for a building that needed diurnal temperature range. So this, un, under this big piazza here, may, you may or may not know, is a, is a very large labyrinth. It's the largest labyrinth in the world, uh, which is these concrete passageways that, that sit between the crash deck uh, and, the, and, the, and the Civic Plaza at, a, at different, uh, different and, the, and it sort of it slopes upwards. So these were the first diagrams that young Paul Stoller drew when he arrived at our office in 1980-something or other, 1990-something or other. So it was his first job was to diagram Fed Square. So the, these are the, the, the ripple walls. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this was before we put the top the, the deck on. There's a crash deck. And this was just a void that they didn't have much to do. So all these panels, the air that comes into the, the galleries in Fed Square goes past about 160 meters of concrete surface before it arrives comes in quite slowly, low speed fans, not too much power use, but it basically eliminated all the chillers and any kind of cooling equipment. And of course, we'll be there for hundreds of years if you, if you leave it there and if you don't knock Federation Square down. Um, but so it's a kind of, it was an idea we had at the time around intergenerational thinking. Okay, you're making an investment in embodied carbon, but you have this kind of idea of just thinking a really long game. That's what's going to keep things working. So the air comes in from outside. It pushes through the labyrinth. And then we have some separate little air handlers that push it into different parts of the building. But the main space we're serving is the big atrium on the west side. And we have lots of nice diagrams of how it all works. We also do a bit of evaporative cooling with rainwater uh, when, when we need it in the hottest weather. But our analysis was showing that the, the labyrinth would sort of, this is outdoor temperatures, would pull that temperature down. Uh, so that your average supply temperature is somewhere around 20, 22 degrees centigrade. And the client, because the building is open at both ends, the clients say, well, in hot weather, we'll be in shorts and T-shirts anyway. So that's kind of fine. It's an appropriate solution. 
Since then, of course, <clears throat> with a bit of the, the climate change issue, has pushed the temperature in, in Melbourne to over 40 some days. But actually, it seems to be it seems to have great resilience to that because the you will get uh, it'll get a bit peakier. But it actually has, as I understand it, and I'll find out more tomorrow because I'm doing a tour of a labyrinth tomorrow afternoon after 21 years. It apparently does react very well to that, and it keeps the, the temperatures uh, very, very comfortable and controllable right through the year, which is great. So that's the main atrium space. It's a bit gloomy, um, but this is where the air comes in through these wooden floor grills at low level. And my talk tomorrow night is in the theatre there. I'm not at all nervous about that. Um, so then, this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, with Peter and Don, uh, the original architects for the project, and uh, Paul, had a, we had a party in there, I think, earlier this year, as far as I can make out, so there we go. So inspired by that, actually, th that's generated a whole series of projects. And it's one of the things about doing, being innovative. One of my favorite quotes is from one of my Irish clients. We were doing a project with Foster and Partners in Cork. And I gave him a whole afternoon thinking he wanted to hear about innovations. I was about innovation, innovation. And he took me aside that and he said, Patrick, he says, I want to be innovative. I just want to see where it's been done before. <laughs> and, uh, and it's sort of, that tends to be the way the world goes. You know, you have to show people that. So once we've done a labyrinth, or two, we've suddenly found we've had a quite, we've done a lot of them around the world. So this one's in, in the US, in Maryland. This one's at Kew Gardens, underneath a, a glass house in Kew Gardens. These earth ducts are the other things we've been developing. Um, probably another Irish fellow going, I don't know why they need such big drains. But um, that actually is where we bring all the earth into the building. So we have three big earth tubes that bring air into the building. Those, those, so it's other different types of systems. This is in Ankara in Turkey, a big a headquarters building in Turkey, which has them. So we found that we've able to, to do them, and it, but they do have an embodied carbon issue. You know, one's got to be, be honest about that. So that's the first bit, Ant Hills, Labyrinth, that sort of thing. So the, the next project I want to talk about a little bit because it's got a kind of very interesting circular economy kind of story to it. Uh, are the gardens by the bay in Singapore. Have, any, have many of you been to, on, the, on the way through? I mean, it's, a, it's one of those projects that you kind of wish you could have retired after finishing. It was, that was 10 years ago now, so we haven't quite managed it, because it was just the perfect nexus of a great architectural team uh, with our good mates at Wilkinson Air, uh, fantastic structure engineers at Atelier One, Grant Associates Landscape Architects, and we just had a great time doing it. And most of all, a fantastic client. But the brief I had was a building that used less energy than an, a Singapore office building was the only way we were going to get it across the line, which, you know, it's a glass house, 24-hour operation, and it's on the equator. But that was the brief. They said, if you want to get, the government said, if you want to get the, the money for the project, that's what you have to show us how it works. So that was, that was quite a serious problem. But also, so this is the master plan. So um, the Marina Bay Sands Hotel is here, um, and the glass houses sit up on the waterfront. Actually, it's an issue about daylight and sunlight because the, um, the glass, the, the, the huge swimming pool on the roof thing uh, across the bay casts an enormous shadow across the site for much of the afternoon and the uh, daylight's a real precious thing for the plants that we have in the glass houses. So we pushed them as far away from the building as we could so that we guarantee we got as much daylight as possible. So the master plan was geared to sort of pushing the glass houses to the water's edge and then there's a 55 hectare garden, uh, themed garden with the big super tree clusters um, that were a word we invented actually at a meeting. Um, we thought we'd have to have a name for these things, the, the super trees. So that's a, a view down from Marina Bay Sands with the two big glass houses uh, and the super trees. Now the challenge of the project was that the plants in the, um, the dry conservatory are from the pink areas of the world and the pink areas of the world get 18 hours of sunlight in the summer or daylight and sunlight, whereas on the equator you get 12 hours. And it's also very rainy and in a tropical area, a lot of cloud. So about 40% of the time, it's cloudy. So you don't get a lot of light. Uh, uh, um, and light was what it was all about. We needed 45,000 lux for more than 500 hours a year inside the space. So a typical office building, this is what, probably 300 lux or 400 lux, 45,000 lux to make the olive trees and the other plants survive. And then the green areas are from the high mountains. So it's cool, but it's humid. So we had to make a, a mount, uh, the other glass house has cool and humid plants in. So we did a huge amount of work on the daylight, working with Atelier One to try and, we started at the competition stage with these big fin structures, and they were um, letting, letting not enough light in. So we gradually deconstructed the structure until the end, it's a very narrow, shallow grid shell with these uh, props that go over the top that stop the grid shell from falling over. Um, so it's all about the daylight uh, as well as the sort of structural efficiency. And I'm 
in danger of going on too long. This is a whole, I could do a whole talk on this building. I haven't got a lot of time. But the whole, the, the stick here was that we, we were invisible systems. So all of the cooling sits in the floor. So we absorb the sun as it comes in and take it away through chill water pipes. Uh, and then we have air supply coming in at low level uh, into the space. So air supply comes in at low level into the space. And then we've got a big sort of snorkel at the, at the top here, which pulls the hot air back. But the, the trick to the air conditioning system in the end was that we, um, sorry, I should say, I've got a slightly other sequence, but these, these are the air supply. And then the tropical, in the, in the um, cool moist conservatory, we, we let off foggers every 20 minutes to completely saturate the air. And if you, get, if you are there, make sure you go and see when the, when the, the mountain is fogging up, because it's pretty amazing. So how do you do that with no energy use? We, we had a system when we went in for the competition which used a uh, thing called liquid desiccants. So desiccants are the things you might, when you buy uh, shoes or leather goods or whatever, you get a little bag saying silica, do not eat. You can get a liquid form of that, which is lithium, lithium chloride. You basically spray that over pads, drive air over it, and it takes the humidity of the air from sort of 90%, 100% down to 30%. And you can then, very, with very low amount of energy, cool it. Um, and, but you have to boil off all the water you've taken out. So at our competition stage, we were using solar power to boil it off. And then we found that we just couldn't put enough solar panels on the site to do that, because they have sometimes three or four days, five days, without any solar energy. So I was at a cocktail party with the head of um, uh, National Parks Board. Very important to go to all the cocktail parties you get invited to, um, because you might get some useful information out of them. And what I found out was that he was looking after three million trees in Singapore. So all of these trees are tagged. I don't know if the slide's going to show. No, it's not. Um, are tagged, and they, they basically um, give each tree in Singapore gets a haircut once every two years. So if you drive around Singapore, you see trucks with loads of hardwood. And we said to them, what happens to all the wood? And he said, no idea. I'll go find out. And we found out that they were incinerating, taking it out of the city and incinerating it. So we intercepted that waste stream. And we now have 14 articulated lorries full of biomass arrives every night into the gardens goes into a biomass store, into a boiler, uh, and the chimney for the boiler is hidden inside a super tree. The boiler heats a steam turbine, or heats steam to make it drive a turbine. That turbine drives one of the chillers. And then the waste heat from the turbine goes to drive absorption chillers, and the waste heat from that process goes to drive a desiccant. By that, so by doing that, and we have surplus power then to run the, the lighting and things in the garden. So by doing that, we're basically able to run the entire gardens off a, a waste stream from the city. Um, and it is, it's a lot, it's 500 cubic meters of timber every night. So these truckloads of stuff come in at night time to, to make the garden work. But it's, it was just a great sort of moment where we find this kind of ecosystem that we could generate to, to, to save the energy. And at the same time, we got a pretty, pretty cool and uh, an amazing building, which is one of the great sort of destinations um, as, a, as a visitor attraction. I'm not going to talk to them on this, but we have done some tall buildings too, and I know I haven't got time to talk about these, so I'm going to zip past. So this, this, this interesting um, buildings, uh, I was talking to some of my team this afternoon about this amazing wall in the Comcast building. But anyway, I'm not going to go on about this, but we've done a number of tall buildings in America. But I wanted to get to this, the last part of my talk. Oh, there's also, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with Google over the years, um, and this is with Heatherwick Studio and BIG in London the big sort of ground scraper, which is sort of the opposite of a skyscraper. But it's quite interesting in that we're really starting to see, even in London, the growth of kind of biodiverse rooftops and the introduction of greenery and biodiversity into the rooftops. But I want to get on to the last part of, uh, of my talk, which is just reflecting on, on what we've been doing. Um, this is with 3XN on uh, a tower in, in London for British land at 23 Finsbury Avenue, um, where the entire driver for the design is based around carbon. Now, British land, uh, a couple of years ago, well, they're more interested in it, shall we say, than they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's always been a challenge to get people to get involved and interested in embodied carbon, and that has certainly raised the game. So this project was completely geared around both in, in, the sort of energy, biophilia, all those good things, but most of all, it was geared around embodied carbon and materials. And we spent a huge amount of time trying to get this building down to 550 or 500 kilograms of carbon a square meter. So why are we interested in embodied carbon so much right now? And what's the, what is the big deal? So the IPCC report um, from this year said urgent climate action can secure a livable future for all. So it's a more positive kind of message. It says we can, we can, we can achieve, we can, we can make it a livable. 
But what it then goes on to say is that the trajectories of carbon emissions over the next few years will determine our success or failure on that. Now, that may seem blindingly obvious, but actually when you look at a time horizon of 2030, you start to realize that the differences between the way that, the, the way that we, our buildings perform is less driven by the carbon that we're going to use over the, you know, over the life of a building and much more driven by the carbon we're going to emit when we first put it up. So what does that look like as, a, as an issue? Oh, I just want to talk quickly, just to be clear to everybody, what embodied carbon is. Embodied carbon is a CO2. It's calculated by the CO2 that's emitted when materials are made and transported and assembled. And we might have a discussion about whether it's more than that, but I think that's probably what it is. I have been in meetings in London where clients talk about demolition and say, when you knock a building down, you release carbon dioxide. You don't. You know, there's not little bubbles of carbon dioxide coming out of concrete when you smash it up. So the embodied carbon is very much in the manufacturing and processing of materials. So that's something to be, so just to be clear about. So when you look at a, the building embodied and building operational carbon, you see that there's a big, obviously a big plug of embodied carbon at the beginning. You get fit out embodied carbon, and so it goes. With operational carbon, you get multiple possible trajectories depending upon how green your building is, but the relative values of those are, are what's important. But what's really changed in the UK is the, the issue with the, the, body, the, sorry, the carbon in our, in our grid. So in 2013, our grid was 550 uh, grams of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour delivered. As of uh, the other day when I looked, it was 95 to 100. On average, it's around somewhere at the moment, it's somewhere around um, uh, 150. Now, uh, and it, it, so I should say, it went past natural gas in about 2018. So it, it's got to the point now where when you put a heat pump in, the operation, the carbon emitted by our operational energy is, almost, is so low that we need to think really carefully about the value of the savings we make by investing in materials to make those savings. So as a provocative to discuss later. A provocative example of that is, in the past, we would have always said, let's put an aluminium shade on the outside of a window to keep the sun off. But actually, if the embodied carbon, the now carbon, is more than you'd ever save in the operational carbon, is it carbon effective to do that? So how do we make that judgment about the balance between the two things, which may, is, and it's complicated, but how do we make that judgment to determine whether we're being carbon effective in some of the great decisions we make in our buildings? In the Australian market, I've just dug these out in the last couple of days, New South Wales, and so just to get that number in your head, UK is around about 150 on average at the moment. New South Wales, on a good, good time when it's, it's lots of solar, is around 280, but once the sun goes down, you're about 680, it's, it's quite high because of the coal. Um, this is the plan trajectory for, I got from Statista the other day. For the, for the Australian power industry. So it does mean you're, you're lagging a bit, but the issue is still the same. It's still about, the, 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 the balance might be different, but the issue is still very much the same. So if you took a building a few years ago, we were always thinking, right, well, there's the, operation, there's the embodied and the operational sort of steps up and after five, 10 years, it's overtaken. Now we're seeing with our very low carbon grid that the operational carbon never top trumps the, the, uh, the embodied. And, so, but, and certainly if you're looking at a 2030 time horizon, Investing in reducing embodied carbon is the biggest game in town right now. It's the most important thing we're doing as, a, as, a, as an industry. And, and the operational is still really important. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying we understand how to fix that. We as an industry don't really understand yet how to fix the embodied carbon properly. And we rely on lots of people in the process. In the UK, we've got a couple of guidelines, the Letty Climate Emergency and the RBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, which really changed everything. 2019, 2020, you can download these. Uh, free, free online. Immediately, the Lord Mayor of London and things issued design guidance setting targets between 550 and 800 for, for the um, for embodied carbon in buildings. And our whole industry pivoted to spending almost every meeting talking about nothing else but embodied carbon, which has been, it's been good. So as a result of that, we now have a very clear picture of where the carbon goes in our buildings. So this is a project we're doing in central London with, with AHMM. And you know, we had a, an early number. We kind of know where it all sits, but once you know that, you start to think, actually, I can make decisions. We need to use it to make decisions. So if you reduce the number of basements, move, move. I mean, one of the things we dig huge basements for bicycles and showers to avoid, to avoid the transport carbon of bringing cars into London. Hmm. Um, discuss. <clears throat> and we also, you know, have a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this, the systems, but 
It, once you know where the carbon is going, you have the opportunity to have a discussion and, and take it seriously. So this is my sim idiot's guide to how to reduce embodied carbon in buildings. So the first thing is, don't knock them down if, unless you have to. Um, and so this is a project, Space House, which we've just put through the same process. This is a, an office tower from the 60s. We've put through the same process as that new build I was talking about, and it's at about 320 kilograms of carbon square meter. So about half if you keep the existing building. So that's the first easy win, try and keep existing structures. Basements. We all love a good basement. We've never really thought much about the carbon that goes into basements. Something like 25% of the carbon in buildings goes into basements, and yet we dig down and down and down. Oh, ferries going. Um, but you know, really being mindful of that, because it, it is an enormous part of the load. Tall buildings, I did, I, I did give this in the CTBUH in Singapore, which obviously goes well when you do this, but you know, clearly as you build taller, you have a premium for height in the way that you, in the way that, because the uh, resisting sway loads and, and movement loads it goes up quite a lot. So it's quite a big premium for height. The thing that we really all can grapple with is, in a, in a new build, is the issue of columns. Because if you, we've, we've got used to building big column grids, because the developers like big column grids, the interior fit, you know, interior fit outs are easier with big column grids. My argument is, nobody ever walks into a column, you always walk around them, you can have a few more, it doesn't kill anybody. Okay? So, 12, 12 by 9 grid to a 9 by 6 grid, immediate saving of 20% in carbon for the whole building, because of the, the amount you're resisting, all, all that extra weight of the floors that you're not carrying down to the ground. It just makes things simpler. So building smaller grids is something we can all do tomorrow. And it, amazing, it doesn't cost any more money. You know, it's actually not costing extra to reduce carbon, which is usually the reason people don't do things. And if you're as good as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you can do some beautiful columns as well. So there we go, there's a, a, a challenge for architects. Materiality is obviously a big part of this as well, and a lot of our conversations in the UK are around um, the way that you build. This is a, um, a graphic from AKT2. But it's, we're showing that our standard way of building office buildings in London, which is a steel frame with a composite metal deck with concrete sloshed on top, is the worst way of building in terms of carbon emissions. Timber is generally the best, and we can debate sequestration and how you deal with that, but also a mix of concrete and timber, steel and timber, concrete and timber can give you good, good, uh, good compromises. But the, the main message of this is that the grid is what really does control how much your carbon emissions are. How am I doing for time? Okay, nearly, I'm nearly there. Um, Transfer structures. Singapore loves a good transfer structure. I see from out the window, you kind of quite like a transfer structure here in Sydney too. Transfer structures are really, really high on embodied carbon. Um, the, 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 when you bring a grid down and then bring it onto a sort of f five floors up, you go, all right, I'm gonna change the whole grid system, I'm gonna do that and that and that. A lot of carbon. Okay, so don't do that anymore. Um, and this was popular in Singapore. Um, Cantilevers do have a very, very, very high, uh, to come with a very high carbon cost. And so I'm not saying don't do them, but we need to be aware of where we're spending carbon or expending carbon to make buildings. So these sorts of structures have a very, very high carbon footprint, but we've never really thought about it or felt accountable for it. And we, we kind of need to now. M&E, the more, we've, we've, we're certainly searching our souls on this a lot in the UK because we have made systems so much more complicated to try and drive the operational carbon out of the buildings. So we have multiple layered different sorts of heat pumps with heat exchangers all over the place to drive the COP of the chillers as high as we can and to drive the heat pumps as high as we can. Actually, keeping it simple is pretty important because we, we do have a lot of embodied carbon in the M&E services. Uh, the facades make a big difference. The facades are mostly driven by form factor. So the taller and skinnier you go, the more you carbon you get per square meter of built floor area. So that's just a, a sort of fairly obvious thing, so short and fat is more fun. Processors are also new. So this is, these are processes that we're learning. So this is basically a typical uh, thing we do with clients where we're looking to hit a target. We do a first pass. It's a bit like a cost plan, and you do a kind of a waterfall diagram that shows, we do a waterfall that shows all the different things one could do to get down to the target. And because that starts to get a bit boring after a while, we've invented a game, that's, we gamified it. So if you have a, your camera out, you can scan the QR code. Um, and effectively, what we then do is try and rank things in terms of cost, in terms of risk, in terms of program, um, and you can look at it in different ways. And I'll let you for a second to do that. And then once, you, once we do that, <clears throat> to make it slightly more interesting, we, we basically turn it into top trumps. Um, and so all of the, all the possible options have a kind of top trump card that goes with them so that at least when we do a workshop we can try and figure out with everybody and get everybody engaged in what the, what the issues are in take, driving the carbon out. 
So this is a kind of di design team engagement in, 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 in driving carbon out of the buildings. There's also a big R&D component to this. So this is one of our live slide decks in the office that looks at all of the different emerging materials. So everything from you know, mushroom-based wall panels to, um, to low-carbon cements. There's a lot of resistance to lots of the materials that are coming forward, but eventually it, the, we'll, we will see a big change. And what we are seeing in the supply chain already, just as we as designers and builders see a, a change in the way, that, uh, of the way that we're thinking about buildings, we also see the supply chain, the, the steel, the concrete, and the the glass and the, and the aluminium people, they also have a trajectory. So that today, so this by about 2030, they will be, their carbon emissions will be lower and lower. So and as an industry, we have to keep our foot on their throats as well to make sure they stay and, and keep doing it. So it's, and it also, but it also means it's quite a moving target. So when you're specifying a building now, you might hopefully find that the carbon emissions and the materials you're specifying will go down over the life of the project. Um, so all of that is, is, makes this quite a complicated sort of moving target. Um, I don't know why this slide keeps dimming, but the, the big issue with this is it's very much a team problem. It's no longer just the architect doing something or just the sustainability consultant. We all have skin in the game. The structural engineers, the landscape architects, the interior designers, everybody's responsible for little bits of carbon in the building. So managing it and controlling it is quite a complicated process. We have to set targets. It, different members of the design team get different ownership of the targets, and as time goes on, you're constantly reviewing, feeding back, making sure it gets into specifications, and so on. So it's a pretty complicated exercise, um, very akin to sort of quantity surveying in some ways to drive the carbon out of the buildings. But the most important message I leave tonight in some ways is that for years we've thought about the operational carbon as one kind of stream, and the embodied carbon as another stream that all comes to a kind of end number for the building. But the, what's, what we're really seeing now at this nexus is, is this complicated interrelationship that we need to start to analyze and understand in the context of our power supply grids and things to really understand, and we're starting to develop parametric tools to do this, to th this really complicated problem of how can you be as carbon effective as possible in a building? Because you, you need, we need, we've got a limited, um, uh, limited um, ability to emit and we need to control it, and we need to understand whereabouts the carbon sits and how we're going to fix that. Finally, I just <clears throat> wanted to say that there's um, the move that we want to see also, excuse me, in the near future is, is from sort of the, what we would call conventional development, which is using you know, benchmarking tools, gives you a green building, which is a little less negative, um, going through to a kind of sustainable building, which does no additional harm and really starting to think about how restorative or regenerative design can be part of our, part of our language. Um, and, you know, the, it, I've been seeing a lot, I've been in, I was in Bali on the trip down and I've been in talking, with, with, in talking in terms of the First Nations, thinking around um, how we learn from nature. And I started the talk talking about the termites, um, which is, a, I, I'm sorry if I'm a bit frivolous about it, I've, done it, I've been talking about them for a long time. But actually, this, is, this issue of reconnecting with nature and really re-understanding we are part of nature and we need to be much more respectful of nature and weaving in the wisdom of nature is what we ought to start thinking a lot more about doing in our buildings. Um, and the, but the fun, asking ourselves a fundamental question about whether I'm healing or destroying life with the decision or action that I make in the design that I'm executing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. It was fantastic. Um, it was a nice sort of beginning and end, you know, you sort of went back to the termites in that regenerative way. But please don't put another blade through the middle of a termite. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but um, one thing that struck me was you said, um, I really truly want to be innovative. Just tell me where it's been done before. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the the nub of the issue that most practitioners and try to deal with, or regulators or consultants trying to, to uh, convince their clients. But anyway, we'll park that thought because it will lead to some questions. But I'd like to invite our panel, our esteemed panel, to come and join me over here. We've got Jen Elias, who is also from Atelier 10, an associate in Sydney. 
uh, with a focus on sustainability and building performance and over 10 years experience both in Australia and the UK um, in, and on many iconic projects. She was also a member of the Ladies Steering Committee in the UK and works with CB, CIBSC and neighbours in both the UK and Australia and is on our Sydney committee as well. So welcome Jen. Also, we have Phil Oldfield, who is an associate professor and head of school at UNSW Built Environment Sydney. His research is focused on the decarbonisation of architecture with special interests in tall building design, embodied carbon and life cycle thinking. And finally, Jesse McNichol, who is the urban design coordinator at the City of Sydney. City of Sydney. Um, and his recent work is focused on regulation for climate resilient design of buildings and urban places, transitioning to walking and a cycling future. So we've got a great lineup of speakers to discuss and probably us, uh, sort of prompt, prompt some questions from the audience as well. So I'm just going to sit down here and I hope everyone can see, see the panel if we all sit. But I just want to begin with you, Patrick. I think we'd all agree, in this audience, you probably get no argument about we've got to decarbonise the built environment and we've got to do it as quickly and as effectively as possible. And I think we probably would get sort of wide agreement that we need to focus on embodied carbon. Um, and that's where we're all focusing our efforts now. But as you also pointed out through your incredible diagrams, that it's really complex and there is a lot of interdependencies um, and you know you gave us some great sort of killer facts you know about superstructure and substructure and and I, that was good but in terms of where to I mean you're right at the cutting edge of innovation and you've got to convince all of all of the laggards to actually come along the journey. Where do you think the biggest leaders are that are ripe for exploration? Where we should be really focusing our efforts and to actually, as you, to use your words, be not only more carbon effective, but regenerative? Um, do you know, I, in some ways, the embodied carbon uh, piece is a little less about innovation and a little more about pretty pragmatic just application. Um, you know, it's slightly disappointing to say that. I, I mean, I love, I love, love being out there doing kind of cookie things and enjoying, uh, enjoying selling kind of alternative ideas. Um, I think that where we're starting to see, uh, in, in great detail, rather too much detail, but in the UK, we're starting to see a thinking about how do we dematerialize buildings by doing things like, you know, going back to what we used to do, running air with thermodex systems, running air through concrete slabs, so we haven't got to put ducts. We try and um, persuading our clients not to have their kind of requirements for very small zones to be like the Scandinavians, German buildings where they tend to have just very large zones. The buildings just kind of are, are not controlled very tightly. So you can start to take a lot of the sort of layers of complexity out. So I, I think that's where we're seeing the most innovative thinking. But actually, just to get down to a baseline, where we're driving every building from a kind of baseline of 800 or 1,000 down to 500, just by dif thinking differently about materiality, thinking differently about grids and about all the things I showed, actually that's not that innovative. It's just kind of just as all getting stuck in and figuring it out. Um, but I do think the next layer of innovation is how do we then absolutely strip away materials and try and build materials with, build buildings with as little as possible, which is, is, is more difficult for sure. Um, the one other thing I'd say that is challenging is that a lot of the time we're challenging brief because there's things like, you know, the structure engineers in the room. How many structure engineers have we got here? I'm sure there'll be a few. But, you know, we're still building buildings that I think it's fair to say that office building floor loads are designed to take legal company filing cabinets that are four and a half metres high full of paper. Why? You know, why are we not building structures that can that take appropriate floor loads? The funny story about Gardens by the Bay, when we were, um, I tell you one, we're ex examining the structure, um, they asked about this one kilonewton a square metre, which is standard in the Singapore design loads for rooftops. And they said, well, it's for snow load, because it comes from the British standard. You go, when did it last snow here? You know, when did it last snow in Singapore? It never has, is the answer to that rhetorical question. But, you know, we were they're gonna, so we took the snow load off and the room, roof became inherently lighter. So, that's a bit of a, it's a gaggy story, but I 
generally us starting to question the brief, questioning design temperatures, questioning occupancies, questioning particularly post-COVID diversity of usage to make systems more effective and efficient. There's loads of areas where we can sort of nibble away at the edges to, to make things better and, and be less, you know, we just over-design buildings at the moment. So trying, that, that is the innovative part, is trying to persuade clients to reduce the specs and have the market still accept them. I might just go to you, Phil, in terms of this space. You know, what are you seeing in terms of your research, in, ter in terms of that innovation, and, and where you think there are uh, leaders or interesting kind of observations that you've noticed in Europe and Australia? Um, hi, everyone. Um, if I was to say globally where is perhaps leading this, I might say France, because it's one of the very few places that regulates embodied carbon. So it's a limit. So you build a house now in France, a minimum, a maximum, sorry, of 700 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. But they've set a 10-year plan for it as well. So every three years, it drops down 10%. So by 2031, they've said, we will reduce embodied carbon in buildings by 50%. It's regulated into the system. And if you imagine where we were with something like um, Natas, we sat at six stars for, what, 11 years? Um, so they've set that plan, and that's really quite progressive. But, and I think as Patrick mentioned this, their operational emissions are incredibly low. So in the UK, it's 150 grams per kilowatt hour. In New South Wales, it's about 680. In France, it's 60 because of nuclear power, because of the nuclear power. So they don't have operational emissions like we do. Our operational emissions are 10 times higher, which is why they focus on embodied. So there is a little bit of this, you know, working out where we sit in the system. And, and similarly, we, somewhere like Denmark, they've said every building's got to have a life cycle analysis every single building. They annualize emissions and the cap, there is a cap of 12 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. And if that seems really low, it's because they've got a super low grid it's as good. well. So I, I think some places have started to regulate. I think where we have jumped a little bit ahead is we've now started to measure through the sustainable building set, which is a lightning leap forward. To understand something, you first need to measure it. And if we can measure it for a couple of years to understand what's good, to understand what's average, to understand what's bad, and then start to regulate, I think we'll be in a great position. What can we do to get some consistency in measurement? Because as you know, there are as many tools as there are days in the year. Yeah, yeah it, it's, a real, it's a kind of um, really pertinent question. We, we, stood, we took one metre square brick wall, and we ran it through five embodied carbon tools. And we got, I think, from one end, we got 26 kilograms of CO2. From the other end, we got 69. So 150% difference. So consistency, if I gave a building to two different companies now and told them to measure body carbon, I get two very different figures because, you know, what do we include, what do we exclude? A lot of figures exclude the services. You know, the, the analogy I often use is if you've got a, you're building a building, you've got 50 tradies on site and they drive to work, they drive to the building site. Do we include the emissions of their, their driving? If they have a sandwich at lunchtime, do we include the emissions of the sandwich? It can get slightly philosophical. Um, so it's not a technical thing. And lots of people measure it really differently. And I think, from my perspective, we cannot let the perfect get in where the good. Let's pick a goddamn method and, and make it work and, and commit to it, measure for a few years, revise. We're not going to get it perfect. We've just got to start measuring. So, Jen, you've been involved in a lot of development of tools in terms of LETI and, and also in Australia, you know, on, on various committees. So, what, what do you think's been or been effective, and what do you think is going to be more effective, or what do we need to be more effective in terms of regulation and tools for practitioners that are usable and friendly and easily translated to practice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think. Reflecting on, obviously, Patrick coming from, from the UK, I, I think it is important that we all in this room uh, recognise how important Neighbours has been in terms of measuring operational energy within buildings and having a way to communicate that clearly to the market. What is measured gets managed, and we've done that so effectively in Australia in operational energy. Having Neighbours come to the party with an embodied carbon tool, I think, is going to be the game changer both in terms of having a consistent way of measuring it, but then um, having a way to report that back in a way that's going to drive change within the industry, I think is really 
going to be yeah the the next step. So Jesse, I might just go to you. I mean, most developers are motivated by risk and reward, um, so that they'll do something if there's an incentive, like a carrot, or or if they have to. Um, a big stick. So in terms of being part of an authority that regulates and also advocates for sustainability, I mean, for those of you who aren't from Sydney, Sydney is a very sustainable city in terms of its policies. But what, what, are, you, what, what are you doing to accelerate take up from community and from developers and from um, government? Thank, thanks, Helen. Um, I think the, the the challenge is vast, and the the spheres of operation are. We've been talking about the high end, some of the biggest kind of developers. A lot of people who are very motivated to do the right thing, and I think you talked about incentive, and I think shining a light on something um, helps people um, to then create incentives around it. I think that that is absolutely spot on. Um, I'm, I'm in the regulation space very, very solidly. And so sometimes we talk about bonuses and incentivizing things, but actually an incentive is just a regulation by a different term. Um, the kind of development space that we're operating in needs to become much more sophisticated very, very quickly. And so the kind of systems that, are, that you spoke about in Denmark, where they're looking at the relationship between embodied and operational carbon, that needs to happen today in Sydney for all of our biggest buildings. I think that there's a very large segment of the market, though, that are a long way from being sophisticated enough to operate in that space, and we just need really straightforward rules so that those people know what to do, because they're not going to get to work with the Atelier 10s, unfortunately. So I think we need to, as quickly as possible, develop some standard rules for people to follow who are not going to be in that kind of sophisticated space. I think the other thing is that we have to we have to move very, very quickly to work out strategies for the existing fabric of our cities because most of the buildings that are going to be here in 2050 are already here. Um, you know, the proportion of the buildings that are going to be new builds vanishingly small, actually, if we stop building so much and start retrofitting. We need, to, we need to increase the amount of retrofit that we're doing and the sophistication that we're doing that. So, so very recently we did a project on, on sun shading and exactly that issue that you, you were talking about on commercial buildings came up where the embodied carbon of the sun shading is a big issue. And so the, really some of the things that we, we also need to bring into the conversation are around um, health and safety and externalities. Because obviously with some of these things, even a good project may create unintended externalities for other people or it may create a safety issue. And so we need to expand the conversation to make sure that we're covering so, um, for those who don't know about your sun shading, so, I mean, like, so, you know, to be provocative, I could say that this downtown Sydney doesn't look that different from what it looked like 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, obviously, fully glazed curtain wall buildings are sort of uh, still here for some time to come. So, can you tell us a bit more about the sun shading study? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, the commercial buildings. If the external effects of reflecting all of the heat onto your neighbours is not really an issue, then maybe external sun shading is not, not a huge deal for commercial buildings because people can go home at the end of the day. Um, it's probably not the right thing to do, but you know we can we can have discussions about whether it is or isn't. It's largely, I think, driven by um, the salespeople who say, you know, when the when the person comes in who's going to lease this, they need to get an unobstructed view of the opera house, and if it's got some obstructions, that's the wrong thing. Now, whether that's a real constraint and how much emphasis we should place on that, I guess, is a discussion that we should have. Um, but in the residential space, I think it's quite different, where people might be in their homes, and in spite of the fact that putting sunshading might have quite a significant embodied carbon cost, 
If the power goes out and they've got no air conditioning and there's 45 degree days for five days in a row and you have a curtain wall system and actually they're exposed to really high internal temperatures and the lifts have gone out and they can't actually get out of their building, that's just dangerous. So in spite of the fact that there might be an embodied carbon issue in putting, say, sun shading on the building, it's probably a really important thing to do. And we should probably not be building buildings that are exposed to, to the sun where they could actually be dangerous in the future. I think there's also, you know, comparing back to the UK, um, Australia's got a really long distance to travel in terms of getting sufficient renewable energy capacity into our electricity grid. But the challenge that we have in Australia is very, very, very different to the challenge that the UK have, have surmounted and that France have surmounted, in that we also have a, a, a very distributed network of uh, generation resources, and we need to, as consumers, become a little bit more adaptable in when we can use energy. And that's where things like sunshades give us a lot more flexibility in the way that we, as users, operate buildings and use energy and that enables us to make the most of intermittent sources like renewable energy in a way that's going to get our grid carbon factor reduced a lot faster. So I think we need to, to recognise that it's not just embodied versus operational. There's another factor in that, and that's time of use and adaptability. Yeah, and I, I think um, we sort of really underplay the, the role of the client, the role of um, government, you know, the client who makes decisions. And also the end user, you know, right through to the end user, or the guy who buys the sandwich and carbon. Um, but right through the end user of actually knowing how to use their environment to actually engage with the environment to actually moderate it, you know, and minimise that energy consumption and use of materials as well. So um, I want to ask the audience if if you have any questions because I'm conscious we've. We, we're just talking up here amongst ourselves. Are there any questions, you know, burning questions? Yes, would you just... I'm not sure it's a, not sure it's a burning question, um, <clears throat> but do we think, just looking at the French solution of saying, let's just regulate, set a cap, reduce it by 30% per year, rather than worrying, <coughs> worrying about the tools, set a cap and achieve that, is that, I can't see that likely in the Australian political environment, either at the state or the federal level. But it seems to me that would seem to be the way that one would have to go to get really meaningful shift um, by, by, you know, people measure what is valued. Uh, and, you know, and it's the same as your, the incentive exercise where you've got the British land people said their bonuses are measured on uh, a reduction of um, carbon emissions. I'm interested from the Australian perspective, what would be needed to achieve that from a regulatory point of view in Australia? Political upheaval. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, what the evidence base says is you regulate for the bottom of the market and then you incentivize for the top. So we know in uh, Natas that, you know, six star was a minimum, 80% of buildings got built at six star build to the minimum, so you do need minimum. I don't think we should have an embodied carbon cap yet, because I don't think we're, I don't think our systems, our, our markets are in place, but I think we need a couple of years to measure, to get our um, measurements, consistency, our systems in place, and then we can start capping in a, in a couple of years. But then you've got to incentivize the top, so why do we have, you know, we have some of the best office performance in the world, in Sydney and Australia. And why is that? Well, one is neighbours, as, as, as Jen has said, and, and two is, is because we have um, clients are competing with each other to get 5.5 or 6-star neighbours. And now you, you've got companies will not go in a building unless they've got 6-star neighbours. So you need to incentivise and build that kind of market as well for the top end. But I just think it's an important message to say that irrespective of whether you've got the measurement or the control or all this, that as a design community, we have, we have a, it's a pretty clear understanding of how you can begin to drive carbon out of buildings. So I think, it, yes, you know, it, it's, there are definitely different levels and different ways it's going to be adopted, but it, it's really about all of us getting together as a community. And Letty is an amazing community. It's a, it's a non-governmental, 
completely industry-led initiative to drive the carbon out of London buildings. So, you know, it, 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 the, the worst thing that can happen is we stand back and wait for the government to tell us what to do, or tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm just going to tell you that yeah, there, we, we do know, we can see, you can visualise where we're spending carbon in buildings. So the, there is just a shift in, in the design mentality. Sorry about this. Keep my head straight, that's yes. the answer, isn't it? I, I like addressing the room, it doesn't work. Um, so you, you, there is a shift in design mentality that we just all need to learn about and, and take the easy wins. You know, take the easy wins. It's not that difficult. So it, maybe if I could just build on that. I think that one of the things that professionals can do is to, to constantly speak to government and particularly to politicians about the fact that it's possible and desirable. So there is, there's an extent to which um, some parts of our industry are uh, kind of quite silent to politicians. It's actually really, really important for politicians to hear from professionals that these things are desirable and that actually in some ways Australia is lagging behind. So, so part of it is actually switching from just being professional to being somewhat political. Well, we'd agree on that, wouldn't we, Caroline? <laughs> um, Okay, are there any other questions? There's one right up the back, or two right up the back. I think we just need a microphone. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yes. So I, th I thought the measurement comment was really interesting and just a, a sort of fairly trivial example to illustrate how impactful it can be. So we put solar panels on the house a couple of years, or a year ago, and now on my phone I've got a, a little app that measures generation and usage. So I went from lo a f losing a 14-year argument with my wife about, you know, the kind of operational use in the house. I won it, like, within about a week because she could see that if she, you know, does whatever, and the kids are saying, if we operate the house in a certain way, it's a win. So if that, and, and sort of appealing to the comment also about the director, uh, the developer's kind of motivation, if they can see in real time decision-making yeah. effects wouldn't mind betting it will impact people because you know, these are individuals, they often don't know the choices they're making. Take that as a comment, yeah, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, a, quick, a quick question for Patrick, coming back to labyrinths. Uh, a few years ago we were designing a building, the Sustainable Buildings Research Centre, we had a bunch of consultant engineers on one side and a bunch of research engineers in sustainability as our client on the other side. There was this intense modelling argument about whether a labyrinth actually worked or not. Um, at the end of the day, it became academic because on the client side, they decided to take it on as part of the research agenda. So we didn't get a conclusive answer to that question. Obviously, it's got to do with location and size, et cetera, et cetera. But in a nutshell, can you tell us when it will work and when it won't work? And in light of the embodied energy question and minimising embodied energy in our buildings, is it actually worthwhile at all? OK, there's a lot, of, lot, a lot packed into that. Certainly, I mean, where it works best is in places with big diurnal swings in temperature, big daily swings in temperature. Um, it, it, as with every other low carbon technology, there might be points at, at the peak when you can accept it's not going to work completely and you have to do something else to take the, to take the peak. So if you, we tried at Melbourne to make it do everything and it, and it just about does and we have measured it and it works. If we try to model it now with mo our current modeling technology, it would probably say it doesn't work. But we have data from, and then we get the same with the Earth tubes. When you try and model them, because it's so hard to model the heat transfer from these very complex airflows and surfaces, and you know, it, it, we almost find computer says no a lot of the time. Uh, and the first ones that we built, we did the calculations sort of manually without using dynamic techniques. And we kind of, yeah, that about works. I wouldn't say it was the back of a fag packet, but it was a couple of packets of fags. Um, and, it, and now we would do lots of modeling, and we do find it much harder to prove that they work, actually, because the, you, the modeling is almost always a bit conservative compared to the data that we've got from the buildings, which shows that they do actually really work. So the climate needs to have a good diurnal range. So not in, in Singapore, hopeless, you know, it's the same temperature day and night. There's no point in doing it. And you, ideally, the diurnal temperature range sits 
each side of the comfort band so that you're kind of storing energy from day to night. So Ankara in Turkey, we built one, absolutely brilliant, works, works a treat. Um, so when, is the embodied carbon worth it? I think it's a really, really hard conversation. I think what we would try and do, because these are largely non-structural, self-supporting, we would probably be using materials like SEMFree because then we're not relying on them for structural, long-term structural support. So you don't get all the worries about longevity potentially if, if in structural loading. So I think there are ways of doing it. <clears throat> we did a project for Coca-Cola for their um, pavilion for the expo, in, for, the, for the Olympics in London, where we did a labyrinth under the building. But instead of using um, uh, concrete, we used Coca-Cola cans full of Coca-Cola which has a specific heat capacity of 4.19 kilojoules a kilogram, which is much more than concrete. So we actually get more heat capacity in a can of Coke. So you could actually, you could make the, we made the walls out of cans of, co of, of stacks of Coca-Cola. Um, and we just drove the air around it. Uh, it was only very tiny, very experimental, very short term, but it seemed to work and it was quite a nice story. Um, so look, I, so we're also looking at water-filled labyrinths. We did the British Pavilion at the Expo with S. Devlin. Um, the sort of thing that looked like a megaphone, that had a, a labyrinth that was basically the sprinkler tanks as well. So we just made small, small sprinkler tanks and we drove the air through there and in, du in Dubai you get quite big temperature, diversity, uh, day-night range. So it's, you know, just, we, we <laughs> it's not an easy answer. Uh, doing it all in concrete, digging a big hole to put it in, probably not anymore. Um, but if you've got found space and you can find a way of being innovative with the concrete, so you're not using high, you know, high cement contents and things. I, I don't see why not. Rammed earth would be great, but it's quite labor intensive. So I think we just stay innovative, stay light on our feet and, and, and try and bring these kinds of thinking to the buildings. Are there any other questions? Because I might yep. pop with the last question. Just me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, hi, it's Carolyn. I, I was down at the Institute's conference and there was one session on um, the idea of net zero operational carbon and they were talking about we actually need to think about that not on an annual basis but on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a seasonal basis because it's totally different. And I, I think that, that rather than regarding that as a problem, I just think that and also how do we do a fabric first approach that really works and how do we really regard materials as a valuable resource that needs to be considered I think that's the magic of architecture, is to bring all of that and do wonders with it, not sort of see it as a problem, but as such a design opportunity. I'll take that as a comment. Yep. OK. Um, I think that, um, has, have you got a question? I do. Yeah. Do you still want to say it? I, I would. Yes? I'm just wondering, you know, what's the No, no, wait for the mic. Yeah. Tina Perinotto from the Fifth Estate. I'm just wondering in terms of, um, you know, the, the intense focus on carbon that we now need, and I think it's the most critical thing of all, given what happened in the northern summer um, in Europe. I am just absolutely terrified of what's coming. But, you know, materials is obviously the biggest problem, and we keep coming back to concrete, steel, and what's the other one? Whatever. Um, concrete and steel. Some Aluminium. timber, and there's a lot of issues about timber now starting to emerge about whether it's as actually as good as everyone thinks or as, you know, carbon um, efficient as we think. Are there any really amazing innovations in materials themselves? And it's kind of following on from what Carolyn was saying. Um, I mean, at the periphery, there's a, is, I'll show me to take this, I don't know why I'm taking this. Should I go straight in, Gone. Yeah. At the periphery, you, you, we do, I mean, there's materials, you know, all sorts of materials, whether it's mycel um, you know, mushroom based materials or uh, bamboo, you know, in certain situations, all that works well. In, in the, the big, in the world of big buildings, the, the, the shift is that through the supply chains, moving steel from being, um, you know, using, using coal to make steel to using electro uh, blast furnace, electro furnaces, electric arc furnaces, get it right in the end. So that we're using renewable energy to make the steel, that drives a lot of the carbon out of the, the manufacturing process. Um, we're seeing a lot of work in, in concrete and deco of very, very low carbon cements by not you slaking the, um, the, the cement in the same way. And we, we, those, are the, those are the things that are gonna be real game changers. The problem we have with all of that, particularly with the, the cement one is, you know, there is a, a history of failures in the concrete industry in, like, in the UK, it's Ronan Point, collapsing buildings. We've got some schools collapsing now with some concrete from the 1980s. 
So our industry is very cautious about long-term impacts of short-term changes to the sort of basic way of making cement, which is going to slow it down and becoming a mainstream material. But as I say, when you're not doing heavily structural concrete, I think it's fair to say you can use cement replacements, you can drive the cement out. And it's just like operational carbon. You're looking for the small wins, the small wins across the piece. I think to wait for one silver bullet that's going to solve this is probably going to be something you're still waiting for while the world burns. So we just need to keep pecking away at the small wins and, and, and try and, and bank them. That's, that's the, it's not as glamorous as I'd like it to be. I wish I'd come with you know, a universal solution, but there isn't one. It, and that's, that's part, of the, part of the challenge, or is the challenge. I think um, it's, it's not just a technological challenge, it's a design challenge, as you pointed out. And it is actually a very kind of meaty area to work in. Um, you did actually give us some big design tips, like short, fat buildings are good. <laughs> no basements. Numerous, huh? Yeah, right. Bas no basements are good. What exists is good. We know that. Um, so, you know, less structure overall, less materials overall. I would like to hear from the panel just, you know, like, what do you think some of the, the key takeaways? We know it's not simple. There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet to anything in life as we know. But um, what are some of the key takeaways that you might want to leave the audience to think about? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. I think, you know, go, going back to the question there around um, materials innovation, we look at this as, OK, great, we're going to have this silver bullet and there's going to be this amazing innovation. Actually, no, we know the solutions. Let's do less. Let's be better about using what we already have. And let's be really, going back to that point about pragmatism, let's be really pragmatic about what we need out of buildings. And rather than looking at how can we do the newest, greatest thing, newer and greater than we've ever done it before, how can we look back over history and say, OK, let's just do things the way that we, the way that we're used to, the way that's safe, and the way that works? I guess um, we're talking a lot about material innovation, and I think that's quite important. But my, my comment is going to be that um, the second you decide to build and you decide the GFA, you lock in 60 to 70% of the embodied carbon. What I mean by that is you take a building and, you, and then you build out a timber, you put straw in the facade, you reduce the glaze and you reduce the aluminium. If you do all those things, you can probably save 40% embodied carbon. You retrofit a building instead, or you build half a GFA, you can save much more embodied carbon. So it's, it, it, it is a structural socioeconomic um, series of decisions here as well. It's, we, we're not going to innovate our, our way out of this crisis on, our, on its own. Yeah, I think um, we have to do everything, everywhere, all at once. And um, I think, um, as, as both of these guys have said, it's so many of the decisions that are creating the problem have happened um, prior to us having the brief to build something. Because they're deeply social things, and to transform those social things we have to transform our society and our economy. And so while all of us are good professionals, um, and to paraphrase an Aboriginal architect who I had the pleasure of, uh, of listening to recently, they said, if you're not doing things that make you deeply uncomfortable, you're not doing enough. And that means being political. So if you're just working in your professional field, it's not enough. So you have to actually decide, you know, am I going to whittle away 1% of the carbon in this building? It's not enough. The client needs to be told not to proceed. <laughs> Putting you on the spot there. So you've got the last word. Oh, I thought I was going to be... Um, I've already said enough on all this. Um, I mean, I, I say the most important thing is don't despair. We've got, to, we've got to be optimistic. We're all still designers. We've still got to design great things. The world wants us to build well and build beautiful. So let's figure out how, in this slightly different, through a different lens, we can still be great at what we do. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and on, a, and on that note, I would say that some of the most compelling projects in the Architecture Awards are always the smallest and the sweetest and most sustainable. So um, thank you very much for your shared thoughts tonight and thank you to our panel and thank you for joining us and if there's any more drinks and food left, please enjoy it before we all go.